climate change, air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, excessive waste generation, depletion of resources. These are just a few of many challenges that our planet Earth is currently facing. Nearly all of them require novel technologies and innovative solutions that must combine the knowledge of fundamental and applied sciences, as well as advanced engineering. The overall purpose of the podcast is to discuss about emerging technologies that have a high disruptive potential in related markets and that might significantly contribute to solve the problems of the environment. Therefore, for each discussion, we would like to invite people who have established world-class R&D centers and successfully established companies that innovate advanced technologies, materials, and systems and have been successfully commercializing them in the related markets. Today, as a first guest to the podcast, I would like to invite Professor Yulong Ding, who is a full professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Birmingham. Professor Ding is the founder and director of the Birmingham Center for Energy Storage. He and his team invented so-called liquid air energy storage technology and led the initial stage of its developments and pilot scale validations. And this technology is later commercialized by Highview Power, a UK engineering company. Liquid air energy storage does not have geographical limitations and highly scalable to any size depending on the energy demand. Liquid air energy storage uses air as the storage medium. Excess energy from the grid or renewable sources can be used to liquefy air to cryogenic temperatures and store it in liquid form. When the energy is needed, the liquid air is regasified, during which energy is retrieved by a turbine. There are many other technologies which are invented and commercialized by Professor Ding. We will discuss them during our podcast. Moreover, I would like to say that Professor Ding is my first mentor at an international level. He helped me to join to the leading R&D groups in the world, including his Birmingham Center for Energy Storage. Thanks to him, I have been collaborating and working at world-class R&D centers and leading companies and developing technologies in sustainable and renewable technologies area. There are many things I would like to discuss with Professor Ding during the podcast. So hit the subscribe button, support the channel, and enjoy our conversation. Hello, Professor Ding. Uh, Welcome to the podcast. (laughs) First of all, I would like to say thank you for finding a time. Uh, thank you very much to have such opportunity to talk to you. And uh, uh, so the best is uh, is uh, your question I answer. And <laughs> then we'll see. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, let's see how it uh, goes. Definitely. So, Professor Deng, we, you have been in uh, research for several years, I would say, a few decades. We know that uh, research and innovation are mostly done by a group of researchers, and engineers, right? And you are currently the director of Birmingham Center for Energy Storage, which is part of the University of Birmingham. So what is the capacity of the center in terms of R&D now? Like how many professors, postdocs, researchers, and PhDs are currently involved in the center? Okay, this is a, this question I can certainly answer quickly. So the center was founded by me when I came to Birmingham University approximately 10 years ago. Uh, so I started with uh, just a couple of people, uh, myself plus uh, a PDRA, a postdoc fellow and uh, a visitor. And uh, we grew, we've been growing the center. Uh, and now we have uh, a number, which depends on how do we would say that, how do we, so the center is a cross-campus initiative across the whole campus. We have probably about 160 researchers and, uh, of course, more than 10 professors, you know, probably about 15 or you know, a bit more than that. Uh, the hub of the center is in chemical engineering. And uh, so we are 
is a is a is a core part of the center. We have about eighty researchers, uh, so it's about eight, uh, just a little bit more than eight academic academic staff members, or what you can call them professors. Of course, professors they are different rank, you know, from uh, assistant to associate to uh, full professor, and uh, um, we have about. Uh, 30 postdoctoral research fellows. We have about uh, also uh, 40 PhDs, and uh, of course we have uh, admin support and and, and, and laboratory uh, team as well. So that's where we are. So. That's amazing. A very big uh, research group you have uh, built. So uh, currently you are in a. Uh, your research group are doing different types of uh, innovations and uh, research areas. So I would like to ask, what are the main streams of research and innovation that currently Birmingham Center for Energy Storage is doing? Okay, N let me just uh, uh, first of all say the center has uh, you know, quite a few uh, professors. As I mentioned, each professor has their own group. So my group has about 40 people, uh, about 20 PhDs and 15 postdoc fellows. So which is roughly about half of the whole center. The core part of the center in chemical engineering, so, but it's a small part of the whole across campus initiative. So uh, the area of research we do here um, can be sort of a, you know, broadly categorized into uh, thermal energy storage, which is a, you can sub categorize that uh, categorize that into uh, you know the thermal chemical energy storage, natant heat and energy storage using PCMs and uh, liquid air energy storage. So that's uh, sort of one area. Second area is the um, industrial decarbonization uh, and uh, of course using energy storage technologies. For example, we've been working on uh, steel industry decarbonization. We just uh, developed a new material, something called a perovskite material, which can radically change the way the, the, the foundation industry is decarbonized. The, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cheaper and uh, uh, more elegant and uh, it's more cost effective and more efficient. Uh, uh, so the idea really is to split, split CO2 into CO, which is, uh, can be used as a co co uh, uh, commodity or as a reduced agents for, for steel making, or even used as a, as a raw material for producing fuels in the future. So, so that, that's just the, that area. Of course, we also do some other areas, you know, the fundamental research on colloids, functional fluids, multi phase flow and heat transfer and uh, so in the application area uh, we do a lot with industry and uh, some of the work for example we work on domestic heating uh, devices uh, aimed at a commercialization steps next and all we do cold chain transportation technologies uh, you know the, the, um, and we are working on cooling of uh, data centers telecommunication stations and a warehouse, you know, for cold chain. And uh, uh, we work on manufacturing technologies for storage materials, scale up the process. And uh, um, so we also work on, you know, some of the uh, system modeling uh, optimization and, uh, you know, this uh, sort of and integration of the uh, uh, you know, storage technology with the, with the other processes. And we also work on nuclear power generation integration with the storage. So, so those are just a few of uh, things what we're doing. So. Thank you very much. This is uh, very great. So many uh, research directions. Um, so as you said in the... Um, so you have two uh, mainly uh, in terms of fundamental and then applied research. So 
when you talk about the number of people, uh, what is the ratio of the uh, researchers involved in the fundamental versus applied? So I would like to say, what is the share of the applied um, uh, projects versus uh, fundamental uh, projects? So, okay, the fundamental research uh, is a stuff that, um, it's not stuff that, you know, physicists, chemists, they are doing, but I think it's slightly different. So, uh, so by phenomenal research, we are probably is 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 a is a uh, I would classify myself as engineering scientist, not scientist. So, so, yeah. so the portion of uh, phenomenal research are probably a small portion. I would say probably ten fifteen percent. The rest is a, a is a ranging from phenomenal research to applied. And to commercialization, so we don't do commercialization ourselves, but we would we do something just before commercialization or pre-commercialization stage, ready for the commercial companies to take that forward. So that's a, a what we do. So in terms of, um, so you are in uh, mostly pre-commercialization in R and D part. So over there, you probably have been collaborating with uh, many, many uh, other research institutes all around the world. So how is the collaboration uh, going on right now? And what are the main, let's say, uh, collaborators and research centers that your, your team is involved in together in uh, joint projects? Uh, most of our projects, particularly funded by uh, European Union, UK Research Council, are um, collaborative and uh, industrial projects are not collaborative i mean it's collaboration with the, with companies so you can't share because it's a it's a, it's a it's a uh, the nature of such project is aimed at commercialization you can't share with others so um so we work uh we collaborate um I would say not quite across the world, but I said mainly we work with European countries and Asian countries particularly. I mean, we work with Singapore as well, so uh, Thailand and uh, and China inevitably. But but the the the, uh, the our work are mainly on um, uh, combating climate change, you know, energy and the environmental area and energy area particularly. So energy story in particular. So. Also, of course, we work with uh, European countries because uh, the uh, UK is not part of the European Union anymore, but uh, we, we do work with the uh, Germans, uh, Spanish, Italians, uh, the, um, yeah, and also Greek, Poland, and uh, uh, of course, some collaborations with uh, countries like in US and Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, and South Korea. Um, and uh, and also we are interacting with uh, Brazil and uh, um, South American countries and and some with African countries as well. Of course, we have interaction with uh, with India as well. So Vietnam. Um, so yeah, it's a quite extensive list of uh, uh, collaborating countries. Of course, not all those collaborations are funded. Some are through um, you know. Uh, collaborations through conferences, you know, the joint, you know, the, the, the fundamental research really. So that, that sounds good. There. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is, uh, you listed all your uh, worldwide collaborators. This is very um, uh, broad, I would say. So it's very uh, interesting to know how many uh, countries and research centers you are collaborating with. Thank you very much for this information. And I would like to ask about a uh, uh, very interesting question regarding the Europe, since you are doing a lot of collaboration with Europe. Uh, and uh, due to this, let's say, war between uh, Russia and, and Ukraine, how it affected to the uh, energy industry overall, uh, to the research and uh, development innovation requirements towards the uh, energy that is uh, less dependent on gas uh, or let's say coal or more into renewables is there any significant difference compared to previous years 
uh, I think the difference are significant. I think the, the influence or the effect I think is from two or three aspects. First uh, is the uh, Brexit that certainly has effects, particularly in you know, working with European partners, because I think the funding mechanisms are changing. And uh, so that's one. Secondly, the COVID, which is a, is a three years effect and then the still sort of a, the, the consequences of that, you know, is, is hanging around. It's the second, second, thirdly, is the, uh, the war of uh, Russia or Ukraine. So that's a terrible war, and, and uh, should never have happened. But but the, the, that consequence uh, consequences is, 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 uh, is far reaching, and uh, the energy price has gone up uh, significantly, two or three times, even four times. So people are suffering. So the uh, because of that, um, the inflation has gone up, and uh, living costs have gone up, and uh, the poverty level has gone up. So that that's a uh, is a is a is a is a, is a significant challenge for for for, for um, in almost every country in the world. So, um, but that also um, has some other effects on the determination of European nations, particularly UK, to move towards uh, the the uh, green energy future, renewables. You know. So you probably have heard of the UK has uh, just uh, restructured the government department and uh, they, they set a department on of uh, uh, energy security and net zero, which is a you know a manifestation of uh, you know the importance of energy security and a net zero in parallel. So. So yeah, it's a big challenge, and uh, but you know, the, the, the challenge is far reaching, and uh, so um, it will take time to recover. Yeah, definitely, this war is uh, very, uh, in fact, very bad, and then it has affected to to many lives, including many countries. Hope it will end soon. And uh, on the other side, as you can see in Europe and in the UK, there is a high. Um, uh, demand for the innovations that needs to uh, deliver uh, alternative energy sources to supply the energy to the countries. And I think uh, on the other side, there is an acceleration of the innovation for, for uh, research centers, I would say. So you have been uh, developing many technologies, and among them is uh, liquid air energy storage. Uh, you have um, installed the first uh, R&D scale, let's say pre-commercial scale, liquefied air, um, air uh, energy storage system uh, near the, in, the, in Birmingham, in the University of Birmingham. So now is being commercialized uh, and then is going to be applied soon at the larger scale. Would you give us some background of uh, liquefied air energy storage? Okay, this is the, um, I think the, the, let me just give you a little bit of history of this. So that invention was done when I was in University of Leeds uh, back in 2004 to 2006. So the invention was done there and uh, was funded by Highview Power. Uh, that time it was called Highview Enterprise Limited. So the the so of course uh, Highview Enterprise Limited is still there, and it's uh, so the Highview Power is a brand for you know the uh, Highview Enterprise Limited. So um, so my work involved initial the invention and the initial stage of technology development from NAP scale to towards the 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 pilot scale, which was a, was a uh, designed and built by Highview, and uh, so my close interaction with them uh, uh, was an uh, initial few years until about 2009, maybe 2010, 2011. So the uh, so Highview then designed and built the the, the pretty commercial scale in Manchester, and uh, that was uh, later on. And uh, so uh, uh, Highview is now building the world's first large-scale commercial plant, which is, I think, it's uh, uh, 50 megawatts, 300 megawatt hours, which is slightly different from the what uh, 
is advocated in the in in, in the in the uh, news or media, which the uh, old uh, which is uh, two hundred fifty megawatts hours. That was the initial design, but now they actually the three hundred megawatts hours, so it's slightly bigger. So, um, so the the my interaction with Highview has been continuing, and uh, so the first pilot plant was actually installed in London and then was relocated to us here in Birmingham. And uh, the pre-commercial plant was built in Manchester and actually the currently the full commercial plant is also built in, in Manchester. So, um, so I, my collaborator with Highview also involved uh, between 2014 and 2019 is a, a Royal Academy Engineering Highview Industrial Chair which is a, was a was was a comfort to me, so I was funded by them for five years and uh, developing further technology. So, um, so now the the the, the um, technology is commercialized and it is being sort of uh, um, advocated globally. I think that that will be a strong contender uh, with other technologies. Um, so it's particularly for uh, large scale applications, grid scale. So of course. Our new reason work also shows that that so can be for distributed energy networks, small scale, but for combined heating, cooling, and power applications. And that technology can also be integrated in many ways with other processes, for example, the ammonium production, hydrogen production, and hydrogen storage, liquefaction, and uh, LNG code application, and also industrial decarbonization process. So there's lots of scope for that. So the, the, the just a, you know, a, a name, but a few. So, uh, one thing I want to say, the pilot scale plant is being demolished because it's a, it's a, the time has arrived. You know, we have to move on. So, so uh, it, it take, uh, some space there, but I think we, we, I think, I don't think we need, we need that sort of pilot scale anymore. We have to move on. So that's, uh, the, short update okay that's uh, that's great so the technology started as a r d and then uh, it, it was uh, built as a pre-commercial uh, at, at that scale uh, at the university of birmingham and, um, and and as you said in other parts of the uk and now is a uh, in uh, in a larger scale is commercialized already so uh during the development of uh uh, liquid air energy storage. What was the main challenge when you did the R and D? What was the requirement from the uh, high view power, let's say, so that uh, researchers and uh, innovators could uh, improve and develop? Uh, I would say so. Any technology's initial stage is is, is uh, the paperwork, the, the desktop work is always always easy, and to show the uh, feasibility to show the potential and hence the the the, uh, the commercial part of the work can um, use what we get for um, raising funding because uh, one of the key aspects for taking any technology to the marketplace would need a significant funding and any new technologies will take time typically you know more than 10 years probably 20 years so to to get to the marketplace, so um, so challenges in, in that is, is numerous. But I think the, the probably the funding is the most crucial part of that. Of course, technology-wise, you know the the first uh, version of design that probably is easy. Actually, realize the, the design and, and uh, to get the, the first plant integrated, build up, and then uh, that's uh, more challenging and. Uh, so, so it's a technology wise, or if, if we talk about sort of from the technology development uh, part of the, 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 the uh, process, uh, the, it's a iteration, iterative process. So from initial design, you need to improve and uh, uh, you know, reduce cost and, uh, um, you know, so and you, you need to enhance efficiency and so on and so forth. So, so the process is quite hard. It's not sort of a, you know the as simple as you just uh, talk over a uh, whiteboard or just do a sort of 
uh, use a PhD to, to design a process and doing optimization and modeling. That's, uh, in a way, is easy. Of course, you know, the people can make the models more complicated and uh, doing dynamic simulation and so on and so forth. Using all sorts of tools, those are theory, and uh, they're, they're, they're a bit far away from what actually happens in the actual technology development. It helps the, 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 the main objective is not for modeling, but just often it's just for providing directions of journey, you know, the technology, you know, solving the, te the, the technical uh, problems and, and uh, guiding, you know, the, the uh, parameters and setting for those uh, uh, technology development. So hopefully that will give you a, a sort of a, <coughs> sort of my view on, on that, or the process of being, being through. So when you started working with um, a high view power, the company that uh, right now is uh, applying liquid air energy storage at commercial scale. When you are doing the R&D, you have probably developed and uh, uh, improved many parts and then innovated, uh, uh, provided certain innovative solutions. So um, based on that collaboration, do you share currently um, any uh, intellectual property with the high view power? Uh, I think it's a, it's a, this question is slightly complicated. So, so the first uh, first uh, pattern is with the high view, and then high view has filed uh, various other patterns uh, due, during their uh, development process because companies need to have that in order to have a, uh, have investment. So, uh, my work has been in parallel development. Uh, so, uh, even not with the University of Birmingham. But myself, and uh, because I'm not full time working for the University of Birmingham, so I have uh, my own time to develop uh, new technologies and uh, for high view uh, for for the nuclear energy storage. So I myself have uh, filed a few other patterns, which is not shared with high view, but just for independent development. So um, so yeah, I think the, the the slightly complex, but I think that that's a, that's how things. Is go because uh, I'm not part of a high view, and uh, anything if I want to spend time with a high view that needs to be funded, and of course for any funded funded research, there will have to be agreement between university and a high view so that uh, my costs is properly down. Thank you, thank you. So there is a <clears throat> movie so called a Flash of Genius. You might know it, and uh, it's based on a true story. So actually, the professor of a uh, over there um, in the movie, he designs uh, uh, certain technology that can be applied to the cars. And then he shows this technology. I think it's a windshield, something like that. And then uh, he designs to the frequency of the eyes so that the person, the driver can see the uh, road during, uh, let's say, um, uh, rainy uh, days when he's driving. So the then uh, when he showed the technology and the innovation to the big company and they could easily and uh, just adopt it without <laughs> any uh, you know permission from this uh, uh, this uh, young innovator so then he had to fight with this big company so so this is just a true story and then there is a movie for that and then it's very interesting but on the other side uh, how do you see uh, as a, a university um, let's say does it protect the ip uh, very well when you are collaborating with big companies or is is it still worth to do uh, separately for example uh, uh, r&d innovate something then still can be uh, collaborated with the with the big companies yeah i was thinking the answer short answer is yes uh, but i think a, a, a more detailed answer is a more complex because I think it depends on what you want to do. I think the, the high view is still a fairly small company, and uh, so uh, I don't mind uh, what I develop is used by them. But I think the, the proper license or agreement will be needed because I think the investment. Um, I mean, uh, I think the key things is to. Um, it's rule binding, sorry. <coughs> so it needs to bind by the rules. And, and I think the if, uh, you know, big muscles, big companies want to take her things and, and uh, without her uh, properly acknowledge or paying the fees, 
uh, it's not going to go uh, too further, too far, yeah. because I think they're, they're, they will be sued, sued. And I think that that's probably, you know, the, the uh, I mean, it's essential for both sides. I think the, it's good for them because I think the uh, companies will need to respect the IP. And uh, of course, you know, the um, if, you, if you don't, uh, you know, follow the rules, then there are risk for investors. So, so that's one thing. Yeah. Secondly, uh, think about people can invent technologies. Of course, they can improve further. And uh, because, you know, uh, if they don't have that uh, sort of a, um, ne- uh, improved development, then, then I think um, there's danger that even they have the, yes. a one generation of technology that might have still fall in the future, fall down in the future, so without the proper uh, support from the inventors. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I totally understand. And then, uh, does university help a lot in uh, supporting uh, filing, uh, let's say, intellectual properties, or is uh, is more time consuming sometimes? Uh, no, I think the university has, uh, I mean, here we have a University of Birmingham Enterprise Limited that, that do support the final patents. And of course, they will scrutinize, you know, the if the invention, invention is genuine and so on and so forth, and uh, doing sort of a peer review of those and uh, finding if there is any other patents which is uh, doing similar things. But yeah, I think that it's a, it's, it's a, it needs a lot of efforts. It, it, it certainly is a process which is, is, is interesting, and, and it's a, I think it's a supportive environment. So uh, whether or not you know they are capable or able to or have right people to take that to the commercial uh, world, that's another question, which is a probably you know it's a hundred million pounds question. So so yeah. need a need a and and a, and a also, a uh, university is a charitable organization here in the UK. They are, they are, they are public funded and, and uh, uh, well, I think it's, a, it's joint public and then a private funded uh, universe, uh, organizations. They're charitable organizations. They cannot risk, they cannot take much risk in, in, in terms of this sort of uh, commercial activities. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you ask me, can they protect the IPs? Um, and and uh, I think they can, but I think the the the, the um, if you know say it doesn't happen, you know there's con- there's a there's a uh, fight for the IP. Then I think university wouldn't be able to uh, wouldn't have sufficient money to do that because I think the it's, nature is not fighting for the IP violation because yeah. big companies they have lots of money doing that, but not the university. So. And I think that's why rule binding is important. If everyone abide by the rule, then, then things will be simpler. You know, recently, like uh, technologies like ChatGPT, which is um, AI, is uh, changing already in many areas, including research and development. So it basically can uh, quickly summarize any uh, long long paper, any long texts into short forms. It can uh, quickly write uh, very nice, you know, the uh, summary of the papers. It can analyze. Uh, so uh, at some point uh, during the PhD years, for example, students uh, used to spend a lot of hours to try to read and understand the papers and then summarize the information and eventually write it in their own way, which could take several months. Right now, the chat GPT can do in uh, several hours. So what do you think about uh, chat GPT? I mean, its effect to the R&D and the, uh, publications? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I, uh, I'm not expert in those uh, sort of uh, uh, AI-based uh, sort of uh, tools. I mean, like chat GPT. Um, I, I'm aware of their, uh, you know, capabilities, and uh, I mean, artificial intelligence uh, includes sort of uh, machine learning, and uh, um, it's a massive area. And uh, I mean, they started many years ago. I mean, probably seventies or eighties. So I personally was involved in nineteen eighties in, you know, the expert system 
you know, neural network predict. I mean, this is a sort of crude, uh, you know, version of uh, the, the the work. So, um, so I think the the, and let me say first the, I welcome this sort of ex uh, the tools, and uh, uh, they will enhance efficiencies of the way we do think about you know the, almost you think you know the when we have to write words by words and uh, the publishing world that's just uh, you know revolutionized nowadays it's uh, so easy nowadays so i think the technology development you, you, you can't really avoid and, and uh, that's just the uh, first thing to recognize the positive side of the uh, this sort of ai tools secondly i think the the uh, we have to look at the ethical side of things and and uh, so uh, people have to agree with yes. something which is okay. How we use that, uh, you know, we have to have other rules for for buying that. So, um, so the the um, whether or not there will be advanced to replace, you know, researchers uh, is still uncertain in my view because I think that my understanding of, of the uh, chat G G D is, is based upon the learning, right? So you have to create the learning for training them before they can do something like that. So can they create something? They may be able to create, but I think the 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 the, the if you, if they haven't been trained for creating things, then um, I doubt they would be able to create something original. So of course you know I I might be wrong. I want to be proved proved to be wrong, uh, and so that they they will have intelligence in the future. So, but th th that's a probably it's, it's, a, it's not yet clear uh, from what I can see, at least probably in my generation. So, so um, there will be certain help, but I think the, the think about if uh, two people working in the same area, they use the same tool and uh, think about what the system would look like. Uh, literary view will be, will be probably similar and uh, the methodology will be similar and uh, so outcome will be similar so so will be um will be problematic and uh, because uh, the, if you, because i think the the, the uh, uh, our thesis will be checked uh, for the plagiarism you know if there's too much overlap with others then you, you're not going to go in through the exam process so so yes, lots of challenges and and uh, ethical issues need to be to be done. But I think the uh, search engine, you know, future search engine for Microsoft uh, and then uh, or Bing, you know, the Microsoft version of, of search engine versus Google, I think there's going to be a big fight to you know which which one is going to be dominant. So, uh, so yeah, I think yeah. the yeah, so yeah, I think this is my sort of view. But not may not have not answered all your question, but I think. Um, yeah, it's been discussed. You know, the the uh, popular and uh, so yeah. ChatGPT is uh, yeah. We need to look into the ethical side. Uh, for example, um, uh, Noam Chomsky, a linguist and philosopher, he said ChatGPT is basically high tech plagiarism. But uh, let's see. Uh, uh, over time, maybe uh, we can see some progress in this area as well. Uh, we, from some news, we can see that some, some, for example, some countries and then universities they would like to ban this uh, using ChatGPT in uh, in education. But it, I think, it's a matter of time. On the other side, for example, AI is uh, highly uh, efficient for, for example, data analysis. For example, if you uh, previously uh, uh, PhD students or researchers, they uh, they used to analyze the data. Uh, it could take several, let's say, uh, uh, days uh, on the other side. Uh, these days, automated robotics, including the AI, I think the, the future of R&D will be uh, mostly uh, just looking at the data and understanding and then giving the direction to the AI to which way to go to, to deliver the final, uh, let's say, uh, innovation and the final result. So... Uh, do you think uh, how soon this will start, or do you have already uh, see these kind of changes in the lab, uh, in the environment that you are doing uh, in the R and D environment? Yeah, I think uh, AI certainly sort of a chat GPT is is based on data, and uh, yeah. so 
uh, inevitably there's you know, two sides of the coin. So one side is positive side, which is you know help enhance the productivity and accuracy and so on and so forth. You know the, the on the other hand, because lots of data are false data and uh, misinformation or disinformation, or whatever. So there are lots of there, and uh, and uh, would the AI be able to identify you know those? And uh, filter them out, and then uh, so it's a remain to be seen. And uh, you know, the the the, the uh, um, I think a human being will have to adapt to that technology development. You know, just like you know, many years ago we didn't have a car, and uh, and we didn't have a computer, and uh, so changes around, and uh, so we have to adapt to those. Uh, but with uh, uh, rules. Ethic, uh, uh, so aspects to ethical aspect to be respected and to be to be to be established. So, so it can be very quick because I think the the, the recent development is just so fast and social platform, social media that that's the tools are um, developing so fast. And then uh, and you think about the uh, nowadays, you know, the the, the not so older people like and still like to go to bank, you know. The bank branch is in Hong High Street, but actually they are closing down, and you have to use uh, apps to access to your bank account and so on and so forth. So maybe in the future, uh, you know, not you know, not not very long future, you might use the digital currency and this sort of thing. You know, just have to adapt to uh, resisting to this is is no good because I think you never know. I mean, essentially, right or wrong is just the um, Subject debate, you know. So, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. So, uh, we eventually need to adapt to new technologies, and it will definitely bring us some some uh, good things and then uh, new changes to to our life, including the innovation and then uh, research and development. So. On the other side, uh, you have uh, been working with uh, a lot of uh, uh, young researchers, including, for example, me. It was uh, like 2015, I think, when I was just trying to find a, a research center where I could visit during my PhD years, and I could uh, write an email. So we, I didn't know you, you didn't know me, I just wrote. Um, hoping that you will answer and then you answered me and then you helped me to basically uh, receive uh, uh, me as a, a visiting researcher and then thanks a lot for that and then it was uh, funded by uh, uh, Newton funding from UK it was a big experience and uh, I would say it was kind of a, uh, I never expected it this could happen but you changed let's say uh, uh, the my life later you change uh, helped me to for example go to Singapore to uh, carry out um, uh, R&D at the international level and I I really appreciate uh, your help on the other side you are you have uh, not only me but there are many other let's say uh, young researchers uh, visiting uh, University of Birmingham so how do you usually um, uh, uh, support uh, young researchers that's coming from outside and what for example uh, do you ex expect from them on once they visit and once they leave uh, your uh, research center I think this is a, a um, international collaboration uh, supporting early career researchers is a one of uh, the aspects as academic and uh, um, Need to do and should 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 do and uh, so I've been hosting probably you know lots of researchers from all sorts of countries you know not only from uh, you I was uh, pleased to, you know having you in, in, in the team here and uh, because that's you were the first I think from Kazakhstan as a researcher and uh, of course uh, my also thanks to you to introduce. Uh, uh, my student and um, a student, a young talent student, Yella, to here, which is a uh, grateful for that. It's it's excellent. So the 
uh, of course, we have over years of having researchers or visiting students or fellows from uh, across the world, uh, ranging from Japan, South Korea, uh, German, Spain, Italy, and uh, um, yeah, lots of European visitors, and also some from Asian countries, in India, China, and uh, Vietnam, and uh, Thailand. Um, yeah, I think it's and Malaysia. So, so I've been enjoying work with them, and uh, uh, and uh, I think they're, they're great. And I think they, they, they are so. There are two as well. There are several aspects, you know, with supporting early career researchers or students because uh, we expect that they, they would, uh, you know, understand the culture in the UK, and we would learn a bit of cultural side from them. So. Uh, on top of research, and uh, so uh, I can see everyone has that talent side. So they're good at uh, some aspects. They're not. I mean, no one is good at every aspect. So, so yes. and you you can see those, uh, and uh, you can support them and see them to progress, to grow, to you know. So I think that's a fantastic to sort of not only you know the name from what we do here, but also. I and my and my team are learning from them. So, and I think the 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 the, the international collaboration is essential for you know attack, you know the addressing the global challenges, particularly climate change. So, uh, with only you say of doing well and it's not sufficient. So, so yeah, I think that that's I've been enjoying that and uh, it's been great pleasure you know to have met met with uh, or have been hosting with all the visitors globally. So. Some of those are high ranks and already have, you know, professors elsewhere and uh, uh, some of those have been working companies as well. So yeah, I think it's great to see the, you know, the products from the center. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, one, uh, one question is, so, so far uh, the R&D uh, and an innovation, yes, you are involved in many decades. So if you could go back, for example, to your, let's say, PhD years or the early stages where you just started the R&D and then research, what would you like to change or improve? Um, yeah, I think uh, if I redo, I have a, I'm able to uh, and uh, return to the time. Uh, if I time machine, they turn me back to the uh, well, over 20 years ago, even 30 years ago. So, um, what I would do differently, um, probably I would be more focused on maybe two or three areas, because in my early years, I have uh, done lots of other areas as well. For example, bio nano area. And uh, the um, I worked with the Procter & Gamble on nano cleaning, nano cleansing. And uh, I worked on, you know, the even you know the, the area related to e-cigarette and uh, so um, and uh, you know the um, so yeah I think it's 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 a uh, of course in early career stage you are energetic you can do lots of things you can follow them up not like today because uh, I mean if I do more than a few areas you just you just you can't keep up with the sort of development so. Yeah, if I redo it, I would have probably been more focused, and uh, uh, probably would have, would have sort of, uh, um, would have to probably apply for a, a couple of fellowships to 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 sort of uh, um, uh, to focus more on some sort of a radically new area, um, and I probably would have worked with the company to to develop a spin out, which I already did before, but I think. Uh, um, if I redo it, I would have different. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Understood. So, uh, is is your uh, uh, children also uh, involved in R and D, or, or they are in a different field? Uh, they do. I think uh, I only have one, 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 one child. Uh, he's okay. a son, okay. and uh, he's grown up, yeah. and uh, he's uh, he learned chemistry. First, first degree and uh, did nuclear engineering uh, mainly 
decommission inside of it, you know, deactivation of uh, nuclear fuels and uh, nuclear waste and then uh, as a his PhD work. And then he decided to learn medicine. So now he's a junior doctor being trained, a training doctor. So, so yeah, I think the, the, the um, I think he, he's, uh, he's better than me in my, in my view. And, and, uh, but I think the, uh, young people, um, they have their different life. And I think they, they if there is a one aspect I want to say is that, uh, they are not, working as hard as our as my generation and uh, so um sometimes of course you know not in general but i think at least uh, from my perspective i think we uh, we i would have uh, if i can you know have a time machine turning me back probably i would, I would a i would probably have one more children child and i would probably you know in parallel, uh, put a small amount of time to enjoy myself as well with family. So, so I think for which I slightly regret, you know, didn't spend much time with the family. So that's a sort of a something which is a shouldn't we should have I should have done. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very interesting. And then probably you you I mean uh, as a father and. Uh, uh, and as a son, he could ask a lot of uh, good advices from you in terms of uh, research and innovation, which way to go, because he did a PhD as well, right? <laughs> yeah, I did a, I was a sort of a, I did a sort of a supported PhD because uh, the area, the particle technology which is my area, so so I was able to support him. That's, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Okay, there are other, uh, let's say, um, uh, young, uh, growing generation which are s about to start uh, research and development, uh, about to start uh, their PhD. Uh, what advices would you give to them so that they could uh, deliver uh, the expected uh, outcomes, they could achieve their uh, dreams in a, a more efficient way? I, I would say, uh, if I mean, they need to understand why they're doing PhD, and and uh, so if they if they're just doing PhD for doing PhD, then probably it's not right uh, career pathway. That's one. If they're determined to, do, they have to have passion in certain area, uh, love doing uh, doing what they're doing, and that's the second one. Thirdly, is the the uh, doing PhD or as academic. It's a, never a nine to five, uh, you know, five days a week job. And uh, if they really want to do well, need to work really hard to, to, to sort of uh, achieve what they want to achieve. So similar to academics as well, at a career stage, it's just that they, they are so competitive nowadays. So, so I think the, um, um, so that that's my, would be my advice. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, uh, so it, in terms of, for example, in being in academia, uh, so, so since uh, you are involved in this, since you started your PhD, so did you have at some point um, some uh, thoughts like, should I open my own company and then move out from academia to be, uh, let's say, uh, to make more money or be more... Uh, into uh, let's say application more into into sales of the technologies that you you are developing or you were developing. Okay, I think the the short answer is 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 uh, um, I'm good at research, uh, R and D probably you know towards uh, pre commercial stage. I'm not good at running companies, so I did have to spin out with you know the leads before, but uh, didn't end up with uh, with a uh, Good output, so we have to close them down because that's uh, the, the various reasons. And and uh, so uh, I'm passionate passionate about the commercialization. So I I am involved in commercializing stuff. So of course uh, you know the, I still holding you know some shares in some companies because of uh, my input in the early days. So um, I'm currently we are working with it commercial organization, we have patents which have been signed to commercial companies. So we'll work with them 
So, yeah, so, but, you know, I'm not a right person to need a, a company, you know, for them as a, as a CEO or chairman. But, but I think the uh, um, technical role probably are more appropriate for me. So rather than sort of, uh, you know, the, you know, um, join a company. So, um, but I think for ethical researchers and students, they, they, they need to understand, you know, the working academia will ne- we're never making a lot of money. But through innovation, through event invention, you can uh, have a, a better life through, you know, income in the future because of your research. So it's hard work, but I think the, 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 that, that's, that's important. Bear in mind, you know, academia, uh, they paid a lot of less than, you know, industrialists. So that, that's good. what I would, 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 would suggest. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, running a company and then doing R&D is quite different from each other. Uh, people who are involved in R&D and innovation development they are more like let's say um, uh, more emotional over there. You you are more into uh, uh, beauty of the research and the results. On the other side, in the companies, they need to constantly do the things to achieve certain milestones, and which can be uh, highly stressful. And then not every uh, uh, people would like to go in that direction. Uh, and then. Um, yeah, I understand. So in terms of uh, R&D, so and then innovation, you have uh, plans for the future, right? What is the, the let's say, the achievement the, as a next step you would like to achieve in a, uh, in a period of, let's say, uh, five, ten years? And uh, why you're passionate about it? I think the, the, uh, my academic career is uh, moving towards the last part of the uh, of the journey, so uh, we have developed, you know, the composite phase changing material based technology. Uh, we have uh, developed the cold chain transport uh, technology, and we have developed industrial decarbonization technology for spreading CO two into CO and uh, and lots of other things, which is our uh, thermal chemical technology for heating and cooling. So. So I think the, the I would really want to see those to be deployed in the future. So so my sort of most of my focus probably I would say most probably you know a large portion of my efforts of the last part of the journey, uh, academic journey would be you know on um, commercialization or applied research towards moving towards commercialization. It's not going to be done by me, but I think it's uh, we want to uh, develop technology to a stage which can be taken over by industrial companies. Of course, you know the people I'm working with and the team here that might be wanting to take us forward. That's a separate discussion. It might be uh, that way as well. So yeah, that's a sort of a hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great plan. And as you said, you are uh, about to. Uh, at the last uh, years of the academic career uh, in uh, overall in uh, let's say in UK uh, even if uh, professors let's say they retire they are still as part of the academia right they still uh, uh, collaborate they they are within university they they still can teach right uh, I think it all, all depends I think the the um, I mean nominal retirement age is 65 or 67 depends when uh, how you define that so so I think the the, the um, it's not everyone is involved in teaching research after retirement age so it depends on their range of university so uh, some I mean I have colleagues who are 80s and even early 90s are still doing some work but I think I don't know if they are, have a, they are probably doing that for voluntarily just you know passion about the area what they do so uh, I think the my personal view is that uh, you know if I were to retire I will not uh, retire entirely because I think there's lots of things still remain to be done and secondly yeah. is, uh, is uh, you know it takes time to 
pass on to our young people, young research, you know, and some experience, some sort of thinking, I will support them. So, so yeah, I think it's a small portion for me, maybe it's about 20, 30 percent. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's just uh, uh, what is happening here and that was my plan as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, among your researchers and then uh, young uh, PhD students, so you see uh, some of them, let's say, uh, they are uh, slower in delivering the result, but very uh, solid uh, results very um, uh, comprehensive uh, some of them they are more uh, fast m might be in a short time but uh, still good result and then you they want to move faster so um, how do you usually manage uh, do you uh, for example support to move fast but not uh, significant results or better slow down to deliver uh, uh, big, uh, big uh, or significant results. So our approach or my approach to the PhD student is is uh, sufficient rather than sort of uh, uh, you know. So different students have different style, different stage of development, and then uh, we have to support them accordingly. So uh, at the end of the PhD work belongs owned by PhDs. So they have to still do what's needed, and uh, and uh, of course the standard for achieving a PhD uh, is is a uh, fairly certain. You have to have original research, you have to do sufficient work for the PhD, and uh, uh, of course there's some other criteria, uh, some other rules. You know, you can't really do more than four years because just the, 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 the so I mean, of course, you know, part time can be more than that. If you have a specific circumstance, you, you can do longer. But I think the 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 overall is the main thing is 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 is, 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 is was set in the university uh, PhD student rules or charters or the, you know this sort of thing. So, um, um, I mean, if the work is slow, it's not it's not because of student is slow. Then you know that should be fine. If a student is slow, not doing much work, and, and, the, and that is a problem we have to address. So, so yeah, you you have a big experience in managing R&D team. So, and then based on the delivered results and achievements, definitely you are you are at a very uh, uh, advanced level of managing them. So yeah, so on the <clears throat> closing end of our let's say podcast. So I would like to ask, but maybe you don't, you don't want to give names, but you still, would you like to see some other uh, professors uh, interviewed and then uh, uh, give some uh, interview to the podcast so that uh, you would uh, listen to them and then uh, be more uh, interested in their, let's say, uh, R&D uh, uh, progresses and then their their interesting lives. Any any suggestions? Any professor you would like to be interviewed in the future in this podcast? Um, I think probably we can take that privately rather than sort of, uh, say publicly. Sure. The, 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 sure. So, uh, I mean, I'm happy to share what I've I've done, and uh, but not everyone is, is happy to share. And uh, so, yes. Um, so the the I would say you know. I've been managing a fairly large, large team, and uh, so I think as a part of academic life, not only about management, but also the leadership in academics, because of which direction you choose, which journey you choose, which sort of method you're using, and so on and so forth. So I think that was all important. And, and, and another thing is a culture aspect. So what do you want your team or your group to be, you know, in a culture aspect? Because a uh, mutual respect, you know, the, the uh, following all the rules and, and uh, encouragement in, in a sort of a, in an environment which is uh, you know good for the early career research developer to learn to, to sort of uh, to, to thrive. That's the sort of the key things I think I'll, 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 I'll sort of, uh, want to emphasize at the end of this podcast. Thank you very much for your time, Professor Ding. Uh, thank you for finding a time for the podcast. All the best to you and to your team. Hoping to see more innovations from your team that will 
eventually uh, change the world. Thank you very much.